Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned in to N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in 3, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1. Greetings, and welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Craw Goldman. This program was created to assist humans in this rapidly changing world, and its foundation is based upon the late, great Dolores Cannon's work and humanity's new understanding and acceptance of the quantum world and the role that our consciousness plays in shaping both not only our individual, but our collective realities. I'm a full-time practitioner of Dolores' method and had the honor and privilege of working with and alongside of her for several years. I'd like to thank not only N5D in its support of this show, Dolores' legacy, and all of those continuing for work and discoveries in healing, I would also like to thank our website of dedicated practitioners at DoloresCannonQHHT.com for sponsoring this show. Tonight is October 23rd, 2015. Just a little over a year ago, Dolores Cannon made her transition from the physical over to the spirit side. Tonight's show, and really all of our shows, but tonight's show especially is dedicated to her. And tonight I have as my guest, not only on this show, but here at my farm, our farm, that we call it here in Moon, in rural Kansas, two very special ladies. Joan Murray and Laura Casto are both level two dedicated practitioners. Their journey to become UHHT practitioners began when Dolores did a session for Laura who had multiple terminal illnesses. She has an amazing story. And Laura and Joan both became very good and very special friends of Dolores. And I can't think of really any other people I would like to sit around my farmhouse dining room table tonight than you two to talk about Dolores and her memory. So... Thank you so much for being here, Laura. Thank you for being here, Joan. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Well, we've been together most of the day, and I don't think we've shut up yet, have we? Do you have Do you have voice enough left to talk for the radio show? Uh, I, I I think so. I think so. We can put a nickel on us. We'll go all night. <laughs> That's great. Well, what we'd like to probably do is kind of start where Dolores says is always a great place to start, and that's at the beginning. So how about telling us your story? Just to, as much of your story as you would like to share tonight. How did you find out about Dolores Cannon? And tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, uh, thank you. I think the first time we met Dolores was at the UFO conference. And um, we weren't, I wasn't familiar with her at all. I had, um, I had seen an advertisement for the UFO conference and uh, Dolores Cannon and, and Joan, my partner, like UFOs. And so I was dying at that time, sitting in my recliner, waiting to die with no time, time or hope. And I thought this might be one last thing we could do together before I transitioned. And so we went to the UFO conference there in Arkansas. And um, Dolores was the keynote speaker. And I remember we we bought a book, a couple books of hers. And I walked up to her in my walker and my oxygen. 
and we started visiting. I wanted her to sign a book, and she says, I can help you. And I will never forget looking into her blue eyes and believing her. And so she she looked over at her assistant and told her to put me on the waiting list. And I thought, oh, well, good, I'm on the waiting list. The waiting list was five years then. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so to make a long story short, uh, there was a cancellation. And about a month and a half later, two months later, I'm having a session with Dolores. Uh, I was very ill. Joan didn't think I could make the trip. And so uh, I went in with a walker and on oxygen and um, not really being familiar with QH quantum healing. And so uh, I trusted Dolores and uh, she gave me back my life. And not only gave me back my life, but my children a mother, my grandchildren a grandmother, a partner for Joan. It's just been life-changing. It just ripples on and on infinitely. And then Joan and I became practitioners. And now we're, I tell my story, and uh, it helps my clients believe a little more. And so that's, the, that's basically uh, my story. Uh, I, I had two lower, my two lower lobes had collapsed in my lungs. I had a lot of lung problems. Uh, chronic pancreatitis. I had uh, uh, many, many problems, and most of them were all uh, terminal. Uh, and my body was starting to shut down, and so uh, Joan got me there just in time. <coughs> and so I spent seven hours with Dolores, and uh, Joan dropped off a partner that was, she didn't even know if I was going to make it, the seven hours with Dolores. And Dolores used to say how bad I looked. And and then Dolores was so excited about seeing this miracle happen, seeing my color come back to my body and, and seeing me breathe, take deep breaths, which I was never able to do that. And um, so my life has changed, and I'm, we're both practitioners now, and it was a promise I made to Dolores I knew that I would never be able to repay her. How do you repay someone that gives you life? And uh, and so uh, I told her that I would. I wanted to be a practitioner and help others and spread the love and light and the healing. And and so uh, that's basically it in a nutshell. Johnny, do you want to add anything to it? Well, I watched you cascade downward in a spiral, um, descending into sickness. And uh, I know how sick you were. I know how sick you were. It was uh, it was one doctor visit after another, unless we had to cancel because it was too hot or too cold or too windy or too dusty or whatever. Uh, one after another. And, and so I know how sick she was. I took her in there and she was a train wreck. I went to pick her up. And she walks out toward me with pink cheeks. She's turning her neck. She's saying, look, babe, I can turn my head. She had Mm -hmm. such severe stenosis that she couldn't even turn her head when she walked into Dolores' office. And she said, look, I can take a deep breath. She was taking a deep breath. She couldn't say an entire sentence without taking a breath when she went in to see Dolores. The, the change was astounding. And then I was looking at her and I'm thinking, what happened? And then Dolores comes out and she was beaming. <laughs> she was glowing with, her smile was glowing. She was so delighted for Laura. And then I found out that during the session, the oxygen concentrator failed because the power went out. And I would have flipped. I would have freaked out, you know. But I wasn't there, thank goodness. And they just said, well, she doesn't need it anymore. And they could just continue and so I get this rosy cheeked, frisky little woman coming out of Dolores' office, and I'm thinking, oh my God, the world just changed. The world just changed. So we became practitioners. And you know how there was a, uh, <clears throat> oh, uh, I don't even know how to say it. There was doubt, you know, when you go, you step outside your box and you don't know, but you hope so much. Well, I, I decided to trust too. And so I went in and said, you know, Take it over, and and uh, Dolores gave me gave me back. 
my Laura and uh, her kids and grandkids. She's had more grandkids since then, and we're just so blessed and uh, fortunate, and we're proud to be a part of it and be a part of uh, um, the forum and all the help we've gotten from the forum. I don't post much, but I read and Laura reads, and we learn so much from there, and that's how we feel, feel really connected with the Lauras is, is through our forum. So, Joni is speaking about our um, the, the original Dolores Cannon QHHT support forum where practitioners get together and talk about sessions and offer each other offer each other suggestions and help and um, accolades and and that's how we got to be friends and and I you were saying that. Laura has more grandchildren and, and more time, and, and I get to have you guys here. So I really <laughs> get to be here. We're glad to be here today. Oh. And, to be friends and to be part of this whole amazing uh, quantum healing machine of expansion <laughs> into the universe. With, with it, it touches so many things in so many ways. Dolores was, was an amazing woman. Um, if, if we can go back, Laura, a little bit, can you tell us a little bit more about your story? I know that um, that the oxygen, you, you had brought an oxygen machine that was plugged into the wall. Now, I know that because my mother right now is currently on such a machine, and it makes quite a bit of noise, and it needs electricity to keep going. And there's a part of your session that's pretty interesting that has to do with that oxygen machine. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, well, well, first of all, to explain what was going on with my lungs, I, I had silicone breast implant surgery back in 1984 because I had fibrocystic disease of the breast. That's what they did back then with, with no second guessing. And they put these silicone implants under my pectoralis muscles. Well, they leaked into my lungs. So my lungs were full of silicone, and my whole body was full of silicone. And so it made it very difficult for, for me to breathe. And they put me on oxygen. And, uh, and so, like I had said earlier, my two lower lobes had already collapsed. My lungs were just, my body was just shutting down. And so in quantum healing, hypnosis, you, you you learn to have resolve from your issues, and there's such a, a correlation between our our emotional issues and our physical issues. And so the ironic part about this was that uh, uh, Dolores uh, was talking to me and, and saying, "Well, does Laura understand this lesson? Because I'd gone to a past life and I'd learned lessons from that. Does she understand that this is a carryover? Does she understand the connections of?" what's happening to her life now. Right when I said yes, almost to the second, the power went off. And you could hear my oxygen concentrator making a squealing sound in the other room. And Dolores <laughs> says, uh, what's that? And then what came through to me and using my course, using my voice was, oh, go, go uh, turn it off. She doesn't need it anymore. And so uh, Dolores came back in to the uh, session room, and she had them start working on my lungs. And the minute they started working uh, uh, on my two lower lobes, I could take a long, deep breath. And I remember Dolores saying, just just take uh, a big, long, deep breath, Laura, and, and feel it. And I thought, I haven't been able to do this for years. and And so it was just crazy how that happened. Oh, she doesn't need it anymore. Power goes off. Dolores and I are sitting there in the dark and then no oxygen and then I, I didn't need it anymore. It was great. That's and, just amazing. You're sitting there in the dark because, yes, of course, there's no there's light. Power. There's no light. There's nothing else happening. And and you were dependent on that machine to breathe. 24-7, yes. And Dolores said as soon as they start working on my lungs and inflating my lungs and then they did some irrigation down to and and to get out the the silicone and all the junk. She said my colors changed immediately. She saw it. She used to talk about I saw it before my eyes. Mm -hmm. Laura's color came back. She she was uh, she completely changed after they worked on me after I had the session. 
it was a wonderful experience. Um, I'll never forget that. And, and Laura, when you say they, I mean, can you explain to the people who are listening who might not know why we even use that term they? Why do you say they? Who's the they? How is this happening for you? Well, it's it's some people. It's a energy that is um, that that comes through, and some people call it our higher self or our older soul or universal consciousness, or, or some people call it God or the source, whatever resonates with that session, with that client. And uh, it, it can do, it knows anything, everything and all about you, and it can do anything. And so um, Dolores used to say, I call them they, because they call, they speak in we. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, that's, it's just, I don't, Candace. Help me out here. I don't really know how to, how to explain it. Hey, you did a beautiful, you did a beautiful job. Yes, because it's it's often described as a collective and, collective, and a greater yeah. power than just a singular human. But uh, it, it can be various things. But but yes. Yeah, so um, I'd like to ask you because I know a lot of our listeners out there talk about having sessions, want to have a session. Can you tell us what it was like um, for your conscious mind during the session? During the session, was your conscious mind? Oh, and and I and we don't have a, a screen on, but Joan is like laughing very hard, quietly over at, at my left. <laughs> I, I'd like to. I don't think I've ever asked you that question before. I'm very curious. Was your conscious mind along for the ride? here. Very much so. And And tell me what that was like. Well, and here again, we were not familiar with the method. We just, we met Dolores at the UFO conference, and then she spoke about it. So I had done no reading whatsoever. I was completely clueless. And I went in there, and and, and I'm sort of an independent woman, so, and, and I don't ask for help. That was one of my lessons for this life. And so, when Dolores started doing the session and wanting to call in the subconscious or the energy, well, I didn't know, and I thought, well, do I do it? Mm-hmm. And, and I interrupted Dolores 14 times. <laughs> Did you count, really? Well, on my session, I listened to my session a lot, and, and I interrupted her 14 times, and she was so patient. Uh, she was my last. Wait a second. Okay, okay. I, I got, what do you mean you interrupted her 14 times? What well, do you mean? mean? She would be calling in the the subconscious, the higher self, and I, my conscious mind, was thinking, well, what do I do? What are you supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? So of course Laura jumped in and would start talking, and then Dolores would say, you know, I'm speaking to the subconscious, and then Dolores would shift her voice and say it a little louder, and then then my subconscious would come through, and. But uh, 14 times, and finally the last time I remember they were working on my thyroid, and um, Dolores says, well, let's just call him in, and I said, so I started saying, well, yeah, I'll call him in or whatever, and she says, no, the subconscious. So I'd had enough of, I thought, what am I, you know, what, what's, what am I doing wrong? So then I finally said to Dolores, well, am I supposed to call him in, or do they call him in, or what do I do? And she says, yeah, I know. Laura's been busy uh, interrupting me. And then she said, uh, all, it, all Laura has to know is this is not her responsibility. And I remember thinking, oh, that's good. And then she said, I want I want Laura to just lie there, relax. I thought, I can do those two things. And then <laughs> the two hard words came. Then I want you to uh, allow and receive. And I thought, can I do this? And then I had this dialogue with myself, you better do this or you're going to be crossing over. And so I, I just surrendered to the Lord's then. And and then that's when things start happening too. How, Laura, did it feel when some of those things were happening, when when some of the, like you said, the... Um, the they, the subconscious, the higher self is cleaning out your lungs or, or in, uh, cleaning out your uh, the silicone and, and inflating your lower lungs and the color is coming. What were you feeling? Were you feeling anything in, inside? Yes, I, I felt heat and energy, and then I could visually see the light. 
I, I mean, it was just, and sometimes Dolores would say, well, tell me what's going on, and, and, uh, and of course, then Laura would step in and say, well, I feel I feel light and energy, and <laughs> Dolores earned her money that day. <laughs> But I, I felt uh, I could I could tell what part of the, my body they was working they were working on and uh, light and energy and heat. And you could feel it. And did it, did that surprise you? I mean, yes. were these very surprising oh, yes. things for you? I didn't know I didn't know what to expect, so it was just go with it. I just mm-hmm. knew to go with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dolores did a well. I was with Dolores for seven hours, and so she talked to me for about four hours. And the session was a little over two, and then she talked to me for another hour. But um, yes, I, uh, I I went in to that session being a victim, and I came out a changed woman, you know, learning about agreements. And and since then, uh, John has done the session on me and what came through. Well, if this was an agreement, you know you had an agreement to do this. Uh, so that you can have a testimony of the healing, and uh, it works. And and so if I had it to do over, I would go through it. I would sit in my house for seven years again. Now, you know, that's not a small thing to talk about. You and I were talking about health before dinner, mm-hmm. and I was telling you that I had experienced being bedridden, but just during pregnancy and not near as long as you. And seven years, Laura, is a long very long time, time. Um, and and I remember there were times that I just could never go outside, and so I we just stayed in because it would exacerbate my asthma, and um, and so I remember on my 60th birthday because the kids knew I was dying. My daughter, I loved to eat at Red Lobster years ago, and she got off the good china, invited us over, and she says, "Mom, stay in the room." The back bedroom. I'm getting a little choked up here, but we, I went out there and there was all crab legs and everything all around the table. And she knew I couldn't go to a restaurant, so she brought it to me. And that's love. That is love. And and so I, I think Dolores talked about this on one of her videos about the kids saying they have their mother back. But I think the most defining time after my session was probably a few days after we had gotten back. And I didn't talk to the girls about this because they would have thought it was too much out of the box. And so I walked in and Brooke, my oldest daughter, says, Mom, you look different. And and she knew my color and everything had changed. What's going on? You look different. Well, then Joan and I told her. And then she came over to me I mean, she's a physical therapist. She knows about death, and, and and she works, you know, with many types of people. She knew I didn't have much time. She grabbed a hold of me and did a divorce cannon hug, <laughs> and, and uh, she says, oh, I have my mother back. And I said, yes, I'm back. And and so uh, it was just a very defining session, wasn't it, Joan? Mm-hmm. Joan, when did this take place? When did you have your session? What year was this? Oh, um, I don't remember. Three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I don't years ago. Yeah. Well, I know that um, one of the stories that Dolores tells is not long after the session, I guess, was the, then the transformation conference, and yes. and you showed up there. Am I remembering yes. that correctly? Yes. Thirteen days later. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. 13 days later. Yeah, yeah. 13 story. days later. Well, uh, it, it wasn't without a few bumps in the road no. to go to the transition. 23 days later. That was the 20th, and it was on the 20th. Okay. I don't remember. Yeah. So uh, she's had her session with Dolores. Things have changed dramatically. She's continuing to improve. So we go to the transformation conference because now we know who Dolores is and what it's all about. And so we uh, we don't have to pack everything up, and we just can get up and go. But it made it it was a little bit difficult because she had uh, tripped and um, uh, cracked her kneecap. Now, if she got that wasn't the transformation. Yeah, it was uh, level one. That was I'm sorry, that was level <clears throat> one. So we go to the transformation conference, and and uh, Dolores sees her and just lights up the same way she did when she came out of the session. And every time Dolores would see Laura. She would just beam and hug her in the big bear hug, and they had such a connection. And I can 
vouch for Laura's illnesses as being valid because I'm the one who took her to the doctor. I talked to him about that. You know, they're talking hospice. I'm not liking that. Didn't didn't they say something about medically retiring? I mean, you were told to medically retire. Can you explain what that term means and and how often it was told? Three times. Three times they wanted me to medically retire. And what does medically retire even mean? Because of your health, you cannot continue to um, work. You can't, uh, you can't work. You can't do your job. You can't do what you were trained for. You can't get out of the house to even get there. And so she was medically retired. Mm-hmm. But um, to address the issue of her lungs, a week after that she had a checkup with her um, primary doctor, and he took a chest X-ray, and she said, how are those lower lobes? He said, oh, they look good. <laughs> and they had not been ventilating air hardly at all. You just couldn't hear her moving right. air in them. And uh, it seems to be, uh, yeah, your neck, the stenosis in her neck, she used to not be able to turn her neck. And uh, a subsequent X-ray said no, didn't say anything about stenosis. There was, they didn't see any stenosis in just there. Just gone. Just, just gone. And, and, the, and there's like an arthritis in the yeah. bones mm-hmm. in your neck. And, and my has, mom has that too. And I know yeah. how, how mm-hmm. difficult, how painful that mm-hmm. is. It flattens my, uh, that's why I was on a walker, because it flattened my spinal cord. Uh-huh. And the doctor said you cannot fall because that part of your um, neck or your spinal cord uh, it regulates your heart and lungs. So if you fall and sever that, you're you're dead. It's, so they put me in a walker, and uh, and like I said, I just I mean I, I fell. I don't know. Uh, it was before level one. It was in November. I don't know yeah. when it was, but I had my hands in my pocket in the, in the parking lot, and I fell. And I fell. <laughs> Stumbled and fell and it broke three ribs in my kneecap and they actually me everywhere and there was nothing in my neck up there. Okay, that saved my life again. Okay, so yeah, so I have to ask about that. I mean, did you ex- did you explore? Do you have an idea why the heck did you have to do well, that? Was that to get the X-ray? Was that I mean, no, what was, was that about? Uh, we found out in level one when I uh, uh, we practiced our sessions. Uh, they said, well, you know, we just put a little bump on her step because she's still fighting the lesson on asking for help. <laughs> and then it gave Joni more a chance to, to take care of me again. And so, uh, yeah. I was, <laughs> yeah. But you're right. It did give us an opportunity to have an x-ray and compare an x-ray. And so it was with the um, thyroid. There was a cyst that was substantial. And when she went back, she couldn't find it. Pancreatic cyst. They can't find them now. Well, I have cysts in my thyroid, thyroid well, and then one in, in those in your pancreas, and they they're not showing up now. It's just amazing how your life has changed. And you know, earlier you said that you didn't think that you could thank her. I <clears throat> I think the work that you're doing now, carrying on her work and her mission and her light, her great big heart, um, helping everyone. You are absolutely carrying on her work. And, you know, you are very, very special. Both of you are special. But you're very special because you publicly have come forward with your story. We all know that there are others out there who have incredible stories, Mm -hmm. very similar, if not, you know, um, identical to the kind of recovery that you've made. And yet people out there are still very fearful about what friends or family or coworkers or others will say or how they will judge them. And I was very um I was very curious about this until I realized that people are very much affected by others' opinions. And so I don't judge or blame those who receive the miracles from QHHT not sharing them. Mm -hmm. But there are people out there, many people, and I get lots of calls and and people ask questions on websites and whatever and they say, where's the proof? You know, where where are all the people who are being healed? (laughs) Yeah, again, Laura's holding up her hand here across the dining room table. There are so many of of them out there, but very many of them are keeping are keeping the the miracles close to their chest, and they're keeping quiet about it for any number of reasons. And um, but 
that again is what makes you so special because Laura Casto and, and Joni, you know, you're just part of that because of everything you've done to help Laura be there. But when I have sat in session upon session upon session, year after year, I get to tell your story. Mm-hmm. And I get to point to, you know, your testimonials, and I get to talk about the fact that you are walking around a happy, healthy grandma and helping other people mm-hmm. now. And you are in a wheelchair and multiple uh, walker. Uh, walker and multiple uh, organ system failure and, yeah. and told, you know, to go home and enjoy yourself, and everything has changed since then. I was on liquids for a year because I had chronic pancreatitis. Oh, my gosh. Down there. And so after our session, the Lord says, well, you need to eat something. And we found a Subway. And I remember downing. I hadn't had solid foods for a year. And I downed a, a, a sub sandwich. Remember that, Joan? That was, I just now remembered that. Oh, my gosh. I have never heard that part of this story. I didn't that. Okay, now, hold on. That's significant. That is significant, too. You know, people have been on liquid diets maybe for a week if they had the flu. You were on a liquid diet for a year. Two ambulance rides to the yeah. hospital with chronic pancreatitis. And I found out since then that the silicone um, affects your pancreas. And so that's what was happening. And and so I was on enzymes and liquid. I juiced. I juiced. That's all I could. I couldn't handle shakes or anything. I just juiced. We bought a juicer. And uh, and so, uh, yes, I wasn't used to any food. And so that's the first the first place we saw the subway. <laughs> Okay, just for fun. Do you remember what you ordered? I think it was a, a veggie sandwich. <laughs> I think it was a veggie sandwich, yes. I don't remember. I just remember eating it very quickly. <laughs> and I remember being very emotional. I, uh, Dolores' was love, when, when Dolores does a session, um, I, um, I've never felt that love before in my life. And it's the, the combination of the... Uh, of the energy coming through, and Dolores does every did everything with just pure unconditional love, and she accepted me with all my flaws and misgivings and not knowing this and not knowing that. She taught me during the interview, uh, and also set me straight on a few things too, which I had to take a piece of humble pie with that, but it helped me get better, and and so she was. It's just the the level of love with a, a quantum healing session is just off the wall because as practitioners, we all drop down to love and we're here to help others. Um, but. And so now you two ladies are so busy doing sessions. <laughs> the, and so uh, Joan and Laura live in Moore, Oklahoma, and you know, more Oklahoma has become very famous for its tornadoes. Oh, I think there's some stories coming up here. Anyway, yes, we. that's all right. Yeah, but people are showing up in Oklahoma City, all kinds of people, to have sessions with, with both of you. Yeah. Now, let's hear from you a little bit, Joni. Let, what's going on with your practice now? You two swap sessions and you take clients. Um, tell us a little bit either about Dolores or some of your sessions, something you might want to share. You know, we're remembering Dolores today. Well, we were talking about how um, on how much an invalid Laura had been. And we, when Laura was hit by that devastating tornado in 2013, uh, we went out in the debris field and the dust and there's no shade and, and sweat and heat and rubble everywhere and we delivered meals to the people who were working on cleanup. And before she wouldn't have, for five weeks, and she before she would not have been able to leave the house, let alone go out and climb over the clods and the debris to take food to people and ice water and, and after the tornado. You guys are just angels. I mean, your hearts are so, so big. Well, I'll tell you, we had people come to our, our town from all over the country and even other parts of the world. And we were so grateful. And with that tragedy of those people losing their lives and and their property and how torn up it was, it was unbelievable how how it looks. You just can't wrap your head around it. 
But so much love and kindness and generosity came to us from that. And and that you need you need that. You you can't give, you can't help unless someone needs it and is willing to receive it. Mm-hmm. And uh we, we needed it and we were grateful to receive the help from all over those people. They mm-hmm. were people came from Joplin, people came from Sandy Hook, people came from Hurricane Sandy, people came from Katrina. They knew what it was like and they came all the way to work in the dirt and the dust and the heat to help us and we we're so grateful to them. I've got goosebumps all over my body as you're telling me this story because, yeah, people whose hearts have been broken open by tragedy gravitate towards others mm-hmm. who see some tragedy and mm-hmm. and then the necessity of showing up and offering support and, and bolstering each other up. Just just beautiful. And they, they do spend so much time on the negativity and, the, the you know, they put a focus. When you put it under a magnifying lens, what the bad stuff going on in the world seems huge. But when you look around in your own world, sometimes you see so much good. You see Dolores' mm-hmm. light. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever wherever you think the light comes from, you see it when you look in your world and, and you want to participate in that. And so you gravitate toward that and you and you live there. That's where you live. That's five D. Mm-hmm. You're you're three D and you're <laughs> supposed to be here, but five D is living in love and and extending yourself to other people with love without the judgment and you know the three D people are gonna do their thing. And you know, I'm three D. You know, you're three D you're three D sometimes. I I called over in a in a um you may remember it at one of the reunions. Uh the way to raise your vibration, which is what a lot of us want to do. We want to not have to participate in a world that has so much cruelty and negativity in it. So the way to do it is to to be yourself, love yourself, plant your feet in the 3D by loving yourself, those around you, and the earth that raises everybody up. And so that's I I work with special ed kids, so I'm very grounded in my 3D world, and I am grateful to them every day for what they teach me. How about a favorite memory of Dolores from you, Joni? Do you that was seeing her walk out of, of that office with that smile on her face. And every time she'd see Laura, the way she'd light up, I mean, it, it just, it, it's hard to describe. It's just like this light bursting out from her. And I, I remember seeing her, she'd stand beside the podium, and I just, you know, you just picture it, and I can feel like she's here, and I, I do feel like she's connected and close to us. And um, I thank her every day. Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful. Well, she, and, excuse me, but she came through in the Kindle last night, right? Oh my goodness! I turned on my Kindle last night, and I'm I'm going to check the weather. So I put on the Silk browser, and and um, usually the the tab that pops up is my ten hours of thunder and rain because that's what I need. I need white noise in my background when I sleep. And what pops up but the Laura's Cannon <laughs> interview on the Moore Show. And it's like, where, where did that come from? I hadn't, you know, that wasn't on there. It wasn't bookmarked because I went to bookmark it to see if it was bookmarked, and it wasn't. So I don't know how it came on there, but I guess I really do because the mm-hmm. said, yeah, okay, don't have your time canvases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Dolores sends lots of messages, um, often uh, red birds are are the messages, and, and there's – there's some stories there. Do you have any red bird stories, ladies? Yeah, we were, uh, well, she was anxious about a session. We were sitting in our backyard, and her kids were over, and she was anxious about a session. She was saying something to me about it, and I said, look on the, look on the wire up there. Red bird. I said, you're going to be all right. And uh, actually, when we were driving to her memorial, we are driving down the highway to go to her memorial in Arkansas, and a uh, red bird right across the front of the car. We see them. We see them now quite often, especially when we're talking about her or thinking about her. They'll come to the bird feeder, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, we see red bird. And you see a red bird, you know everything's okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> we had. A, <clears throat> I have a story to tell. I, I had, um, uh, I dreamed of Dolores quite often, and um, I had, I had a dream, but I couldn't remember if, if you know how you can't remember your dreams. Well. So I walked out into the dining room, and and uh, we had our our uh, patio chairs up next to the dining room window, and uh, this little cardinal just 
he just flies up and gets on one arm and, and then jumps to the other side of the lawn chair, went through three lawn chairs to get clear over to the end of the, the uh, picture, you know, the window, excuse me, the window, and uh, turned around and got as close to that glass as she could and, and stared right in. And I just said, oh, hello, Doris. <laughs> and, you know, I, I know better than to doubt anymore. I mean, um, she always is with us. And um, and clients, she, she'll come through clients occasionally, whether you ask or not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the client will just say, Dolores is here. So, okay. She always, <laughs> she always comes in with a smile on her face. Have you, uh, have you noticed that, Candace, with your sessions? She's very funny in session. She is very funny. She definitely has a sense of humor. And um, so in case anybody's joining us late, Laura and Joni uh, made the trip up from Oklahoma to to Kansas for a little visit here at a Tiramoon farm. And um, one of my favorite already memories to talk about is as I was um, showing them their room and where they needed to stay, and we're sitting there chatting, and, of course, we're talking about Dolores. And do, do you remember what happened? Well, the light crackled and it went off, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about Dolores and talking about her being here and being nearby and um, supporting, uh, you know, the, yeah, we were having, we had goosebumps all over our bodies talking about different connections and ideas and things we were discussing and events in the world and our work and and I think it was Laura who said, and I think Dolores is right here. And as soon as she said that, the hallway light went, burr, 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 and it like blinked, you know? And we're like, yeah, I guess she's here. And we both got goosebumps. A total amount of goosebumps. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, the interesting thing about Dolores Cannon, if I may speak for a moment, not only is she visiting and communicating with her family, her QHHT practitioners, whom she always called her students, but she's also communicating with others. She's communicating with potential clients of practitioners. She's just communicating with fans. And in the most astounding of ways, she's also communicating with people who don't even know who Dolores Cannon is. This is kind of, um, you know, she's only been gone a little more than a year, so we're starting to collect this kind of information. But what Dolores Cannon did during her lifetime was she understood and she discovered and she was poised in such a beautiful way to reach through time and space and communicate not only with individuals and their higher selves or what she called their subconscious or other lifetimes or other lives or other existences, but especially the way she communicated with the the very famous Nostradamus, that was a new kind of communication. There's much to be discovered there. There's much, even though those books are written long ago and Dolores is now gone, there is much information coming through sessions where we're understanding that the way she communicated with him is very important for us now, meaning us as humanity. We can reach through time and space and communicate with other beings. Um, We can reach through time and space and communicate with other life forms so many different ways. And one of the most astounding things for me is to receive a phone call or an email from somebody who has absolutely no history or knowledge of Dolores Cannon and then says somebody with that name showed up in either a dream or a meditation or some sort of phantom text or email and they're getting these communications from nowhere and they're they're woken up, they're sent on a mission either to find out more about their own life or their family or their life path or something like that. So Dolores Cannon, who was this amazing woman who figured out communication first, you know, just from the past and then from parallel lives and then, you know, with ETs and other planets and then other dimensions and other worlds and other realities, now from the place where she is, she's expanding in such an amazing way. And all you have to do... Any of you out there, even if you've never met her, 
um, you know, never took a class from her, you can ask to connect with her and learn from her, and and some amazing things can happen. I did this just with my own mother um, just this past week, and I, I'll tell that story right now, and then I'll let you get back and tell it. But this is a great, this is a great, this is a great story about my mom. So, um, my mom was older than Dolores, and if you'd asked me a year or more ago, who who was going to go first? I would have told you. Well, of course, my mother is, but but that's not in fact what happened. Um, you know, Dolores left a little more than a year ago. My mother's still here. She's she's in what I would consider the early stages of, of transition from the physical. But she's up and down, comes back and forth. And the other day, when I woke up, it was just two or three days ago. I woke up and and I heard Dolores tell me as I was waking, and that's the theta state, and that's the connection. That's where you're connected, and you can hear into these other realms. And I heard Dolores say. Tell your mother she can talk to me. All she has to do is ask, and she can talk to me. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. So a couple of days ago when I was at my mother's house, I I took the opportunity to tell her, you know, Mom, um, Dolores said that you can you can talk to her. And she looked up at me, and she said, you know, there was a lady in my room last night. <laughs> and I said, there was. And she said, yes. She said, I looked at her and I said, this is my mother saying this. My mother said, I looked at her and I said, hi, is your name Doris? <laughs> and she said, the, the lady looked at her and said, no, my name is Dolores. <laughs> And and Dolores, who had been called Dolor or Doris, excuse me, more than one time in her life, I'm sure, um, really didn't have anything else to say to my mom. But yet I was very surprised. You know, I was really surprised, and and I I I was gratified. And I said, "Okay, mom." I said, "You know, yeah." I said, "You know, mom. All you have to do is just imagine talking to Dolores, and you." you can be doing that. And and that's the same advice I'm giving any of you who might be listening, who might be interested in that. And so I told my mom that story. I said, just, you know, just imagine her talking to you. And when you imagine that, that, that's her talking. And she said, oh. And I said, and also often her calling card is a red bird. And mom really didn't say much of anything, and I really didn't know if she even heard me. And then when I was there just yesterday, the hospice nurse was there. Now, that's already an amazing thing. This hospice nurse is named Angel. Of course, her name is Angel. She's an angel. She's a beautiful angel. And every time she comes to my mom's uh, bedroom and speaks with her and spends some time with her, my mom perks up. And I was there yesterday when Angel showed up for the visit. And I was just working in the corner uh, watching and observing their visit. And when Angel came in, and Angel looked at Mom and said hi, and Mom perked up and sat up in bed and looked at Angel and said, Oh, Angel, I'm so glad you're here. I didn't think about this. I actually forgot about it till just now, but guess what? I had a dream about Ruby. And so I stopped typing on my computer, and I look up over at them, and I'm wondering who Ruby is. And Angel sits down next to Mom. Mom practically leaps out of bed. This is the woman, remember, who's who's in the hospice, who, you know, is occasionally like, uh, it seems like she's going to just go any minute, and then other times she's like, you know, practically skipping through the house. It's a very strange time. But she sits up, she's animated, she's excited, and she starts to tell Angel about her dream of Ruby. Now, I, a Ruby, and I have no idea who Ruby is at this point. So I'm just watching. And and she says, Ruby came to me and he sat and he looked at me deep in my eyes and he just kept asking me, what is your name? What is your name? And my mom said, my, my name is Eva. My name is Eva. And I'm very interested about all of this. And then Angel says something like, 
you know, I think I can bring Ruby by for a visit. And at this point, I'm guessing it's a pet, right? I mean, it's just the way they're talking. I'm guessing it's a pet. And they start talking about some other things like that. And and Angel starts saying, I need to bring Ruby by in December. I'm going to drop him off at a very special kennel that's not far from you that can take care of him when we go on our trip. And and then they started talking, and then it became very apparent. And and I and Mom said, Angel, show Candace Ruby's picture. And then Angel pulls out her cell phone and shows me this picture of the most beautiful big red bird. And it's I guess it's a macaw. It's a beautiful bird, beautiful red, and of course very very red, golden red uh, color bird. And and then mom starts talking again about her dream. And she says, you know, in my dream, it was like like Ruby had a light inside of him, like he was glowing, oh my God. like he was this amazing, magical bird. Oh. And that's when I knew that there was more and more connection with Dolores here. Mm-hmm. And that's just such a gift. Um Thank you for letting me tell the story. Oh, oh thank you for telling us. We love it's that great story. story. We love that story. It, it shows how they're connected. I mean, divorce is everywhere, and she's helping your mother. It's a wonderful story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so lots of our clients have bird stories as well. For instance, I had a, a client not too long ago who... She had a a life as a mermaid, and she was just opening up herself to the idea of past lives, and she had a regular past life experience, and then in a subsequent um, scene in this exploration, she changed into seeing herself as a mermaid, and this really was quite outside of what she was expecting, even though she had read about this sort of thing. It wasn't something she readily expected for herself. She kind of thought, well, I think other people can be mermaids, but, you know, I'm just going to be a regular person anytime I have a past life. And she had this life as a mermaid, and it really threw her for a loop. Now, for people who do this work, past life regression in the Dolores Cannon method of QHHT, a mermaid isn't all that unusual. <laughs> Not at all. No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've had many mermaids and, um, you know, uh, not all that unusual, but for her and for her perspective, it was quite unusual and that's fine. So she was just digesting this and really not quite understanding, if, if you know, how she needed to think about this and she drove quite a little distance from from my wellness studio here in Augusta, Kansas, towards um, towards central and western Kansas home. And she said that she got home and her husband had made her dinner and they were eating it outside on the deck because it was a nice, cool evening. And she started to tell him about this experience that she had. So she told him about the first past life. And the first past life was a pretty... Um, standard one. She was a Native American person and um, and some of the a story there I think was that some strangers showed up, etc. But then the next, again, the next scene she was shown, she was a mermaid. So she started telling him and in a very kind of, you know, halting way because she wasn't sure how he was going to take it. Um, These are people who have, you know, quite a traditional religious background, and she wasn't even quite sure how he was going to take it. But she started to tell him, and she said, you know, I I really think that this this is something that I experienced in another life, and, and I believe that it's important. And she said at that moment, while she was feeling free enough to share this experience, that she was this mermaid with her husband, Not more than a foot from them on the rail of the deck, a cardinal came and just landed there. She said it wasn't any more than like a foot from from them and their table. And she said they both stopped talking and they just looked at this bird because a cardinal, and anybody who knows birds, a cardinal is actually quite a shy bird. 
um, robins and sparrows, some other humming, even hummingbirds, they will come close to people. But cardinals are quite shy. They don't normally come that close to humans. And here's this bird right there. Wow. And she said they both they both stop talking, and and the bird just sits there and looks at them back and forth through their eyes, oh back and forth for just a little while. She said, you know, it, it was minutes. They both just stopped, and the, and the bird's just there for a minute. And then she said the bird finally flies off, and they continued to be speechless <laughs> <laughs> for a few minutes after that. And then she started talking about that I had talked to her about that because I have some cardinal and some red bird images in the in the studio. And she emailed me, and she said, tell me the truth. Do you believe me? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Of course, of course I believe you. And then she said, what does that mean? And then, of course, I have the, the wonderful, amazing opportunity to tell her that I believe that that is the Lord's canon spirit coming through in association with the nature spirit um, of a cardinal to provide the message of confirmation to her that it was not only a true and real past life of a mermaid that she... Um, you know, experience, but that it was okay to tell it that experience to her husband. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I agree. That kind of validation comes. You hear it from clients all the time. The strange things that happen, and they think, you know, they're thinking, oh, it's a coincidence. But, but no, it's not a coincidence when you have so many. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about uh, people who just discovered Dolores. And they just discovered Dolores out of nowhere. Somebody told them about Dolores, and then they find out she's she's transitioned, and it's like they're so disappointed because they're so excited about her. So we're getting a lot of clients who are really new to even the idea of Dolores, and they're jumping right on board. Mm -hmm. It's not like they've studied for years and years and they've been aware of her, but it's like they, it, there's just this magnetic attraction to Dolores and the work she's done and what can be uh, achieved with this technique. And as practitioners, we help the individuals achieve their own goals and re answer their own questions. We don't give you the answers. We're not channelers. We're not mediums. We are facilitators of a person to find their own truth with their own higher self, inner wisdom, guidance of God, angels, whatever you want to call it. But people find out stuff that maybe they kind of knew or they didn't know at all. <laughs> and it comes through and it's like, bam, you know, mm -hmm. should I leave my boyfriend? Yes. <laughs> when now? <laughs> it, it comes through. Um, they, they can be very emphatic. You know, that's interesting. I don't know why, but it's you saying that. I'm remembering a story of a man who came and, and he sat and talked to me about his very, very rough um, relationship he had with his wife. I mean, it was rough. They... It, they would fight. They would lock each other out of the house. I think one of the one of the stories that he told me, one of the recent ones, was they were on their way somewhere, and he got mad, and and she like said, "Get out of the car," and he did, and he was like five miles away from anywhere. And I mean, it was just you know one of those drama, 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 awful kind of stories. <laughs> I mean, he spent he spent more than two two three hours talking about, uh, and one of the reasons he was there was. Am I supposed to get out of this? You know, I mean, and it just, if, 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 you, <laughs> if you would have listened to, to this interview from this man's perspective, it really sounded like, well, maybe these two might be better living in two different places than, than what they've gone through. I mean, they put each other through hell. They, there was some really um, mean and disrespectful and unloyal things on both sides, and it was awful. And I'm thinking, you know, this is where it's amazing being at a practitioner, right? Because right? you, you, you think, well, gosh, you know, maybe you guys need to do the forgiveness exercise and go on and go, you know, figure it out and, and, and have, have some peaceful lives somewhere else. And you know what? In that session, that man discovered how much he loved his wife. Yes. And he didn't know it, and I didn't know it. But in that session, he found out 
how they were absolutely perfect for each other, even though they were going through what they were going through, the hoops and the jumps and all of the stuff that they were going through. And the the SC, the higher self, was explaining how every one of these huge events didn't break them up. That even though they, they it, it's like they were testing and testing and testing, and, and they and whereas normal couples or regular or whatever other people might sort of show up, um, you know, might 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 decide to, to you know throw in the towel. They would always find themselves back together again, not not able to imagine life without each other. And he left with confirmation that he was absolutely in the in the right place. And he also actually was quite a um, quite a devout Catholic, and so he saw himself in that framework as a as a as a large sinner. He had done some things that were absolutely you know sin. And he said, you know, he was just afraid that Jesus didn't love him anymore. Oh. And actually, I wrote about this on my blog, Jack, Jesus, and the Jouncing Walls is the name, <laughs> is the name of this blog story. But, but the, um, the amazing thing is this was his biggest issue. Past his wife was, you know, Jesus, I can't even go into church anymore. I've done too many bad things. Jesus doesn't love me or whatever. And, and Christ shows up in the session. Oh, my goodness. And, and Christ says, the light of Christ, the amazing light of Christ, and, and all he does is lay there and and he just he's crying. You know, the big, yeah. big tears are coming out of his eyes. And he says, you know, and then he whispers, you know, through his thoughts, he says, Jesus is here. And we as practitioners... We're so blessed. We get to watch these amazing things, and we get to feel the energy of Christ's consciousness show up in these sessions. And we're sitting there, and uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm watching this, and he's sobbing, and all of a sudden I see his hand from the from the bed. His hand rises up, and um, his hand rises up, and and takes the heart of Jesus. He, Jesus takes his own heart out of his chest, puts it in his hand, and then he takes Jesus' heart and puts it in his own oh, body. Wow, that's moving. I have goosebumps here. Well, let me tell you. You say it's moving, Laura? <laughs> let me tell you about how moving it was. Right when he does that, he's putting Jesus' heart. I mean, he's yes, trying. He's yes. saying, Jesus is giving me his physical oh. heart because Jesus was physical. Mm-hmm. He's giving me his physical heart. He's putting it in his chest. And all of a sudden, and you've been in my studio. It's an old brick building, um, you know, more than 150, 200 years old. I'm not even remembering right now. More 100 and, I don't know, 30, 40 years old, something like that. Solid brick walls. All of a sudden, the brick walls start shaking. Oh, my goodness. And the sand and the mortar start coming off the walls, hitting the floor. And I'm I'm thinking, and see, you know, here's, I'm, I'm actually going to the logical place because we have trains nearby. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking, okay, some big heavy train is going by mm-hmm. with, like, military equipment or coal cars or something. Mm-hmm. But I'm not hearing it, but I'm thinking that's the only thing that can shake right. this building like this. That's when we had that earthquake. Oh, it was at like, that moment. at that oh, moment, I think it was a 4.6 earthquake. It was one of the biggest earthquakes that we'd ever had. On, um, and it was, it was, the center was somewhere between where you live and where we live. Mm-hmm. It wow. shook the whole building right then. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that amazing. amazing. Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> that is amazing. That's just crazy, crazy stories. So, you know, we talk a little bit about... Um, Kansas and Oklahoma, not too many people think about Kansas or Oklahoma being a spiritual hotbed. And um, we definitely want to... We definitely want to talk about the kinds of sessions that you've had there in Oklahoma. You've said you've had some really interesting ET ones lately, haven't you? Well, Laura's had more ET ones lately. Um, and it's, it's interesting 
that they, they do come in clusters. They do seem to come in clusters. They, they do come in clusters. And I have had uh, several um, abductees coming and asking for help. Uh, female, uh, females that have been in the program, the uh, um, egg harvesting, harvesting program, I don't know the correct name for that. And, uh, and during the session, we'll find out that they uh, do have hybrid children. And through this technique, they're, they're allowed to uh, make arrangements uh, to see their hybrid children, whether it's in a dream or whatever. But sometimes I feel like I'm talking to the ETs, having a direct conversations with the ETs. And, and so it's, it's uh, the thing I like about the, the quantum healing hypnosis, um, Dolores Cannon's method, is that every session is different. Every session every is different. Session. Yes. And you get to go with them, wherever they go. Oh, and some people are so vivid in their descriptions, it's like having that, it feels like your own session. You, you're there with them. And you don't necessarily get what you want. You don't necessarily get what you fear. You don't necessarily get what you expect, but you usually get what you need. Mm-hmm. And we've had sessions. She's done them on me, and I expect I'm planning my happy place, and all this is where I'm going to go my beautiful place, and I'm going to go off on a tangent. So what you, what you think you're going to do is not necessarily what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. And it can take you anywhere, mm-hmm. anywhere. Mm-hmm. And you can try to imagine, like I tried to plan what was going to happen, and it just didn't go that way at all. <laughs> It just didn't go that way at all. And that's because you allowed it to go. Yeah, I did. I did. You know, I thought, what's what's going on here? I mean, I get on a cloud, and my cloud always moves west to east. <laughs> my cloud goes west to east. Here was one, and, and she's putting me up on the cloud, and my cloud turns north. And I'm thinking, north? I never go north. I always go west to east. This is where my cloud goes. Like a good Oklahoma girl. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. You know where the wind blows. And so it goes north, and I'm thinking, why am I going north? I end up in Mongolia. I'm a reindeer herder in Mongolia. And I went north because the, the circle, the, the closest way, the shortest distance to get to Mongolia is over the north. Oh, that's shorter, faster to get there. So my cloud actually knew how you would fly a plane if you wanted to get there faster instead of going around Europe and everything in that way because it takes, takes a longer time. I looked on the globe. <laughs> so that's one of the amazing things about being a practitioner and being around others. You get to have your own sessions. What was that session about? Do you care to tell us a little more? That session, um, I don't remember what that was about. I remember the, the uh, I was a reindeer, reindeer herder, and um, uh, I, could, I came in and I saw my boots, and they were leather boots, or, you know, uh, animal skin boots. I had mm-hmm. a big cloak on. I had something in my hand. It took me a while to figure out what it was. Just. It's just like a staff. I thought it was like a bow or a spear or something. Because I see all these reindeer. I'm off hunter. Oh, no, I figured out I was a reindeer herder. Those were my reindeer. Mm-hmm. And that's why they weren't running around, and I wasn't trying to spear them any, any, you know, at all. So, so then she takes me to the house. Where do you live? So I go, and it's, it looks like a yurt. So I figure, oh, okay. It looks like a yurt. It had a little taller um, uh, top on it than I expected from based on images I'd seen. Um, but so, okay, I go in the yurt. And I walk in, there's this beautiful woman. She's o- over a cook stove, and she has a pot, and she's cooking something. And it smells so good. Oh, my gosh. I smelled it. You can and she, smell it right now. She, she, she looked up at me and smiled, and you asked something about... Um, uh, how do you feel, how do you about, feel about your? How do you feel about? And that was my wife. And I said, Oh, she's a good cook. <laughs> you know, so I'm thinking I should be saying, Oh, I love her. She's the most beautiful <laughs> Oh, she's a good cook. Is what came out of my mouth. So, um, and then uh, we moved forward to some uh, uh, other days, and there was a day when we were gathering together. We were um, we were nomadic people, but there was a, a time when we were gathered together at a certain season, and we were talking about something, and then it got it got serious, and there's something I knew something was wrong, something wasn't going to be right, and the marauders came through, and it was probably like a Genghis Khan kind of thing, uh, and uh, I, I couldn't find my wife. I think almost everybody was killed, everything was destroyed, and I I couldn't I couldn't find her, and I didn't know where she was. I didn't even know she was dead. Uh, and and so I lived a longer life. I had injuries, but I lived a longer life. And when I transitioned, I was very old, and I went to Spirit Side, and there she was. 
and I put my arms around her. And, you know, and she's saying, well, what do you do next? And I'm just, I just have my arms locked around her. And they're saying, well, we're going to go here, review this, review that. And I said, I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. And I said, okay, you guys can go and rest for a while. And I wasn't going to let go because I was so long without her. And we've had Larry, that was me. That was you. That was, she was, yeah, she was, Laura was like my uh, wife in that light. I mean, that good. Are you a good cook now, Laura? She has a better, better cook in the moment. <laughs> but uh, it was, it was uh, interesting because I have always feared the session when they tell me how I'm evil. That's pretty common. Yeah. Um, but, and sometimes we see that, but but it's not it's well, not as common as you. They kind of came in the back way because I got information that I was experiencing that life, how it felt to be the victim mm-hmm. of the marauders because I had seen one, and that was the counterpoint mm-hmm. to that life. And so they didn't have to show me, they didn't show me that, but I understood it then, mm-hmm. and and I didn't have to go through that that trauma of experiencing mm-hmm. what I was had been doing. So that's kind of what you see. You you see the balance. The, it's, call it karma if you want, but the yin and yang of the mm-hmm. wanting to have an experience, how do you know what this type of life is if you haven't experienced something different? Mm-hmm. And uh, so like, you get a lot more information from the session than you realize when you think. And, and a year later, something can pop up and it's like, Oh, that was that's what that means. You might remember the reindeer herder perspective. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's like being out on the on the um tundra here. We come out here and there's sky and land and, you know, horses instead of reindeer, but that's fine. Horses, you know, uh Laura, you were telling Tom and I about a horse session that you had. Do you care to tell us about that? And, you know, then after that, let's talk about um, Cowboy, because that's a great uh, story about that animal um, story. But let's will you start by telling us a little bit about um, your horse session story, just a little bit. <laughs> we have a request from the audience. I think, okay, well, it was um, uh, Joan did a session with me, and uh, I was uh, supposed to go to my beautiful place, and um, it was a meadow up in the mountains, uh, knee-high flowers, wildflowers, and there was a herd of horses there. And I remember saying, uh, I'm close to them. I feel like I'm one with them. And um, and so I remember Joan asked me later on, after I spoke quite a while, got the same set, where she said, look down, at you, look down at the ground, what do you see? And I said, I have hooves. Mm-hmm. And um, and so then uh, uh, I, I later on found out that, uh, oh, she moved me forward to what's, what's one of the most enjoyable times. You know, I was a horse. I was part of them. Well, I, uh, listening and being part of them, uh, the herd eating, that was my, I loved doing that. I was a horse. And I and then I remember Joan said, uh, well, how do you, do you communicate or something? Or I think I told you. Yeah, you told you didn't me. didn't ask. It wasn't an elite. Yes. Place. And uh, I, I said, well, we communicate with our thoughts telepathically. And uh, I uh, had a, a little foal and was calling to him, and he came. I was worried over him. It was just like being a human with all the drama. How, you know, you've got a child. You have to watch out after it. You're part of this group of people, but you're a horse. And then Joan said, well, do you see a cloud? Yes. Well, you know, and I, I got on the cloud, and I was. I remember looking down at my feet, and my, my hooves went through the cloud when I was going on the cloud. And, and she says, well, are you still a horse? And I said, well, I, I, I think I'm still a horse, but I'm transitioning. I think I, I felt like I was part of the cloud then. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's the first time I'd ever been a horse. And I have this beautiful image of this big chestnut mare with her, hoof, her legs dangling underneath this <laughs> cloud and her head sticking out of the top of the cloud and going probably west to east. I don't know. <laughs> That is so funny. Or if it's summer, maybe south to yeah, to north. South to north. Yeah. So you know, Dolores's method is just so amazing. And one of the amazing things that she teaches is this idea of surrogate healing. 
So any and everybody who's ever taken a class from Dolores Cannon has been taught about this. So you can have two people in a session, the practitioner and then the client, and they can request healing for somebody who's not even there. Normally a family member is the way this works and the very accepted method. But occasionally um, others and occasionally pets. And I don't think, as a matter of fact, I know that I haven't told this story. Um, I don't believe on the on the forum, on the original Dolores Cannon Support Forum for Practitioners. I don't believe that I've told this. Uh, I don't believe I've written an article about it. I think partially because I wanted to wait. Because um, I like to wait because this this story, this thing that happened, happened about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And it's been a year, so I guess it's time to talk about it because, you know, you wait to see, right? (laughs) Or you can, anyway. So the story we're getting ready to talk about right now has to do with a dog that lives here at a Pyramid Farm, a big yellow lab, who's my husband Tom's dog, and his name is Cowboy. And he's a sweet, sweet dog, and he and my husband are very close, and I don't think it's... um, Um, too forward to say that this dog means more to my husband, Tom, than any dog he's ever, Mm -hmm. ever had. So Cowboy and Tom um, are very tight. So about a year ago, uh, just uh, out of the blue, a regular day during work um, at home, I look over and Cowboy's near the wood stove laying, but he hasn't moved for a while. And I'm looking at him and I'm not liking what he's looking like and I'm not liking his energy. And I go over to him and I ask him what's going on with him and he tucks his tail and he kind of bends his neck and he doesn't want to move. And I kind of try try to help him up a little bit. I'm like, I can't really, I don't know what's going on with him. And he's crying And something is very wrong, very, very wrong, very fast, and nobody's here, and this dog weighs more than 100 pounds. And I'm not sure what to do, but I have a really great vet um, not far from here, and I managed to get him in the car, and I know we're going straight to the vet. And it doesn't matter if we do this um, alternative energy healing just by the way. Most of us still... Um, depend on our allopathic uh, and traditional mm-hmm. health care providers in many ways. We just like to use this other thing as information and as confirmation, and, and we're partners now. You know, it's not one or the other, that's for sure. So I take Cowboy to the vet, and he gets some blood work done. And we get a very... Uh, unfortunate diagnosis very quickly. He has a fever. He's in, in intense pain. And we find out very quickly that that Cowboy tests um, positive for systemic lupus, systemic canine lupus. And I didn't know anything about it. There's two kinds of canine lupus. Uh, one is like a skin kind of issue where it's mostly topical and it doesn't really change, you know, their life that way. But this was systemic. Um, It was attacking his organs. It was attacking his whole body. And um, my vet, as as beautiful and wonderful as she was, was I could see it in her face. She was quite concerned. And when I went home, I did a small amount of research and very quickly found out that... um, I believe it was 80 to 90% of dogs who are diagnosed with systemic canine lupus are dead within nine months. I mean, it's that bad. And that's like with steroid treatment. I mean, really not a good diagnosis. As a matter of fact, one of the worst that, that there can be. So I talked to my vet, and she wants to put him on steroids, and I'm thinking you know, I mean, I'm not liking this idea at all. But I also trust my vet, and I'm also, you know, we're going to do what we need to do here. So we do. We put them on the regular medicines, and then we immediately start on the alternative. What's going on here? So Tom and I do a session. 
Tom is the client. I'm the facilitator. We do a session for a cowboy. And this is where I get to look at you two ladies and just say how much I love you. So I don't even know how it was that you guys found out. But you guys found out that cowboy was sick, and I was reeling from this. And Laura and Joni do a session for cowboy. Now, can you remember that session? Would you like to talk, talk about that session at all? Can you remember some of the details about it? I was the one who was under, but I remember, I remember this, you know, asking like where it came from, and I saw a sense. I couldn't get any more specific than that, but I feel I felt their energy just being so drained and so pain. You know, I think Finn wasn't feeling good either. At the Finn time. is our Finn is a second dog, and actually, yeah, we had two things happen at one time. Yeah, and. Uh, we did the session and we're going through it and and um, not sure where it's going to go because this is kind of experimental new for us. But I remember seeing you uh, kneeling down on the floor with the dogs around you and there were globes of light bouncing around like happy puppies and kitties and bouncing all around all of you. And it was like all of your pets from the past all of the animals were, like the animal spirits were coming in. Like some people see Jesus, and some people see Michael, the archangel. Mm-hmm. Some people say the was a version. I saw bounding little puppy spirits. You know, they were <laughs> puppies, but I knew they, they acted like puppies. Uh-huh. So those balls of, of light were uh, energy, and they were all coming in to help. I think they were just bringing their energy mm-hmm. in for you and for them. Mm-hmm. So that was, that mm-hmm. was pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we're grateful that you know whatever whatever we did if we if it helped any that's so. well I know it did um, and and as anybody who practices this work knows as you do this work sometimes sessions run into each other and you forget details if you don't if you don't re-listen there's only one person in the history of the world who can remember every <laughs> session detail and that's the one canon. <laughs> And that's not any of us ladies no, here. No, no. <laughs> so the Lars could pull out any detail of any session or anything, but um, um, yeah. So um, you guys did a session, and and Tom and I did a session. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> what we found was that Cowboy was experiencing something for Tom, so that Tom didn't have to experience it. Because, oh. and this is this happens often with with pets um, that they occasionally will uh, take over either an experience or pain or etc. Um, for you, you know, or in relation with you or in tandem with you, etc. And we we explored that a little more and. Um, I don't remember the details, but I do remember that we decided it was possible for for the experience to be short-lived, that it can absolutely be healed. A few adjustments or changes were um, decided or agreed upon, and healing was offered. And so healing was offered for your session, which was a surrogate session for Cowboy. So, you know, listen to what we're saying here. So we have two friends in Oklahoma who take some time out of their day, and they lay down, and and one goes into trance and connects with a big yellow lab up in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing happens here in Kansas. Tom and I take uh, an evening, and, and we sit down, and we do a session, and we mostly what I remember about that's a, something about a carousel. It was a beautiful carousel um, experience. I, I have to ask Tom if he remembers. But healing is granted in both sessions. Mm-hmm. It's two or three weeks, and Cowboy's looking better, and I'm talking to my vet, and I start to talk to her about the idea of taking him off of the steroids. Mm-hmm. And the accepted traditional method and message is to keep him on it, you know, and and keep going, and maybe you can have him for a few more months if you're lucky, because most of them are gone within nine months. And and we tapered him off, and she said, now this, this doesn't normally happen. We don't normally do this. We normally keep them on low-dose steroids for as long as the time they have left because this is a pretty significant disease. 
But Cowboy was looking pretty good. We also, at that time, I have to put a plug in for this, we changed them over to raw meat. I mean, we took them off of any canned processed um, um, dry dog foods. We put them on raw meat. I'm just, you know, we we went for, you know, the highest quality we thought. Uh, that, and there's some people who are like, are you crazy because of salmonella or other, you know, a, a, a compromised immune system and you're going to give him raw meat? Yeah, well, I think we're going to do that because his wolf and canine ancestors are calling for them. So, uh, yeah, so we uh, we get him and the other dogs on raw meat. And, and it is about three weeks later. It's just such an amazing story. Three weeks later, Tom happens to be at the vet, happens to be there with Cowboy, actually on another errand. I think he's picking up something for another animal. We've got all kinds of animals here at the farm. <laughs> I'm having a session. I think I get a text and I look at it. And Tom says, I'm going to have him retested for this systemic lupus. <laughs> and so he tells us that, you know, I think you should retest him. I think maybe it's gone. Now, my understanding of traditional outlook on systemic canine lupus in the veterinary world, is that once you have it, you always have it. And um, also, once you test positive, you always test positive. And if you're lucky, you know, you you have them around for a while. Well, we decided to take the test again. And it was not an an inexpensive test. I mean, it was a little under $200. That's, you know, $200 is $200, you know. I'll buy you some groceries, right? So but, uh, we retested a Cowboy three weeks after his initial test, and it took a while to come back. And I, I think that phone call was one of the most excited, amazing phone calls I've ever gotten from our vet <laughs> when she said, just no way. You just can't believe it. it it's absolutely true. He came back. It's negative. He, he, he tested negative for lupus. And she was trained by the biggest vet school here in Kansas, and I, I I don't remember if she said she called them first or what, but she, but she called them right away to say that she had a case where within that small of a time, um, the dog was reversed on a disease that's considered incurable. And I know that it has to do with what what you guys did and what we did as well. We done using the Lewis's method. Well, a combination of things. It's like you said, you use allopathic and, and homeopathic techniques. And he got hit with both. And he started out probably stabilizing him a bit with the prednisone. You did a session, we did a session. I didn't know what to do for sure, but I just sent was and light. And all these little happy balls of energy came in to help. And, uh, and then your session, of course, you were so connected with the dog. That had to be very profound to help him heal, and then the change in the diet. So, you know, you're, you're, you're still living on a 3D planet, and you still have to do things like that, eat yeah. your vegetables, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting what you said, too, about the, the raw meat in that it's more um, wholesomely packaged for animals than it is for humans because it's made to be eaten raw. We were... Um, Laura and Joni stayed here, um, of course, for dinner <laughs> tonight. Excuse me, they you know joined us for dinner before the radio show, and of course we said we said the animals first, and we were talking a little bit about the dogs and the cats' diet, and I was telling them this this truly amazing fact. By the way, the vet who, when I told her I was going to feed this dog raw meat while he was immunocompromised. <laughs> Really threw a fit. I mean, she threw a giant fit, um, and she, you know, she was quite concerned as she was being the best vet that she knew how to be. And she was, she was telling me she was concerned about, um, you know, pathogens and bacteria and raw meat. And in a way, she she had a point because at the time we were giving um, kind of grocery store meat until we moved over to some uh, high-quality pet food packaged raw meat. And when she saw all of the improvements that um, that Cowboy had and 
and she started looking into it. And then she also adopted a puppy herself who was raised on Romney. Oh. That, in combination with watching both Cowboy and Finn, who also had his own immune system thing happen at the same time, she immediately changed her mind and is now wow. the biggest distributor of raw pet food um, in, in this county and in this area of Kansas. And, and what Joan was saying about this raw meat is, and this is for you humans out there to understand, raw grocery store meat, just your regular grocery store meat. Now, we're not talking like butcher or maybe some whole foods, free range, some different kinds of specialty packaged meat. But, but your regular, I'm going to go to my case and pull out a package of meat stuff. That stuff is handled in a way that assumes that you're going to cook that meat through to a temperature where certain pathogens are destroyed. They assume that. And there's these tiny little labels on there that says, do that. You must cook this meat to X and X temperature or whatever. So because they do that, they throw these hunks of meat in vats and in places where I, I don't even want to go there to think about it, but it's true. They, they, they kind of mishandle the butchering process and the meat because they assume, and you are supposed to cook that mishandling out of it, oh. right? Mm -hmm. So here's the interesting thing about this raw food that we feed our, our animals. It says on there for pet food only consumption, but it's handled in a way that assumes that your pets are going to eat it raw, so it's handled cleaner wow. than your basic grocery store cut of meat. And yet, okay. and yet the label says for animal consumption only, when in fact it's handled nicer and cleaner than, you know, your basic grocery store meat. Just kind of crazy. So did you did you get the meat at like PetSmart or someplace? Well, we did it first, something like that, a local oh, pet food yeah. store. But then um, once my vet started, I mean, she literally started putting dogs who had skin problems mm -hmm. or dogs who had other kind of allergy things or dogs who had whatever. She was just like, well, how about we try this diet? Maybe that's why you had it. Well, oh my goodness! I'm sure it volunteered to do that. I mean, because now all kinds of pets in this area benefit. It's exactly right. It's wow! Amazing how it extends and it extends itself and ripples mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. and, and Dolores once again rippling out through the through the animals it expands and kingdom. Expands. Yes, it just expands continuously. Mm -hmm. Wow! Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's a cool story. Yeah, it's a cool story. story. Well. Let's go back to remembering a little bit about Dolores. What was it? I know you wrote something down about bubbles. What were you saying about bubbles? You had a good memory of Dolores and bubbles. Yes, what was I that? did. Um, this was after, I think it was the end of Level 2. And um, and Level 2 is a QHHT class. Sorry, yes. Level 2, our class was Level 2. Dolores was teaching it. And we, we all became very close in that class. And... Um, one of our fellow practitioners, MJ, and then also Ann, mm -hmm. uh, brought these wands that at the last day. Oh, bubble wands. Bubble wands. Bubble wands. Yes. Like you get at the dollar store for your kids. They had them wrapped up just in uh, white tissue paper, and, and we'd all sign cards. And it was just to, to show our appreciation. And so... Uh, they started unwrapping them, mm -hmm. and everybody was unwrapping them. And then uh, Dolores started singing. That she started singing this. What's that bubble song? Well, then, curiously, the yes. front door just opened. While you're talking about Dolores, did you notice that? The I feel it. I thought I it was just something. The front door just opened. Okay, and Dolores, we're talking. Okay. Um, and so Dolores, uh, everybody, so everyone else uh, the, they, of the staff. They called. They called the rest of the family up. They called um, Dolores's kids up, and they called a few of the people from the staff up to the stage. And then Dolores starts singing, "I'm forever blowing bubbles." And uh, she didn't blow many because she had trouble getting the lid open. But uh, they were blowing bubbles, and everybody else was standing. And most of us know that part of the song and no more. Uh, but Dolores is singing the whole thing. And we come to find out later, Dolores used to sing in church and that she was a wonderful singer. And she was just in the moment. And it was a, a precious moment to see them up there blowing bubbles with these kitty bubble wands. These, 
he's profoundly metaphysical. Well, <laughs> at one time, when none of us knew the words to the song, we just sort of hummed along, and she's just in her own little world. Yeah. And she has her, away. Uh, her head up to the ceiling just singing like a bird, and we all just felt that wonderful love. And and so then then she she carried us through that part of the song, and then everybody knew the last two parts of it, and we joined in again. And then, we, and then I remember uh, some, somebody there said, well, have you even gotten yours open yet? And she said, oh, no. And, then, and everybody just had a good belly laugh about that because she didn't care about opening it. She just she was aching yeah. in the moment. And, and so then she said, you know, this is what they want us to do. They want us to enjoy the moment. Mm-hmm. And she she got the mic and she stopped and she says, this is what it's all about. Enjoy the moments as they come to you. And so, again, Dolores was teaching us lessons. Whatever came out of Dolores' mouth, she was always teaching. You know that, Candace. Mm-hmm. And Joni, you do too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'll always remember her just having her, her bubble wand wrapped up in her tissue paper, everybody else was doing their wands and there was bubbles everywhere and she was just singing just like a, <laughs> oh, beautiful. It was just, yeah. it uh, was, it was so much beautiful. joy. See, yeah, you just couldn't take your eyes off Dolores. She was, um, like you say, in the moment, just a moment full of joy and we were all so happy to share in that moment and grateful that MJ and Ann had the idea. Yes, and, and we, we all got up, we, we, got, we held hands and we formed a big circle and they passed the mic around and we all uh, said what we how we felt about her, and that was really a gift, I think, for for both for ourselves to to be able to express that to Dolores. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was hard to do it without choking up. Um, yeah, we yeah. had to hold her up. She was starting to get a little weak. Need you? Oh. <laughs> yeah. oh. And I'm there. I'm there trying to think. What could I say to this woman who gave me my life back? To right. What can I say? And I, I know I said something, but uh, uh, everybody was. Pretty much of the same. Candace, she worked at Circle. You remember that? It was amazing. And actually, you know, MJ's in our chat room right now, so you all can say Hi, direct, MJ. You can directly say thank you to MJ. Yeah, that MJ, that was amazing. Gloria liked the little things, didn't she? Yes. yes. Yes, she did. I think she did. I think she did. Yeah, she wasn't uh, foofy, and she had. I remember seeing her in the same shirt so many times. <laughs> T-shirts she liked, and she'd wear those, and it's just like, oh, I'll see a video. Oh, she wore that at the UFO conference or something, and it's like, oh, I'm so familiar with that look. You know, it was, uh, it's just delightful when you can see, and we're so blessed that she came during a, a, an age of technology where all the information and all her presence and her delivery and everything is, is on the videos mm-hmm. and in her books, and mm-hmm. it can get out to so many people. Where in the past, like Edgar Casey, well, he was he wasn't even published much until after Dolores got started. So uh, what we have now is amazing to reach people all over the world. So uh, and I can't believe we're part of it. What are two old ladies from Oklahoma doing being a part of the most amazing metaphysical spiritual thing you can? I know why. This is your heart. Because your great big heart. You know, we, we say that over and over again. People say, what do you need to, to practice this method? It's a, it's an open heart and a willingness to help people mm-hmm. and right. really just mm-hmm. just care for people. Yeah. And if, you know, if you're in it for some sort of grandiose reason or for ego gratification or whatever, it's just not going to work out no. for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and Dolores and I would say they they won't work they won't work for you. Oh, okay, wait a second. So MJ says talk about Dolores's microphone getting kinked, and it was the way they communicated to her they were present. That's right. Oh, Dolores's microphone was messing up all the time. It would be straight. They would straighten it out. They would you know spend all this time getting the mic and the sound and everything set up perfectly, and somehow it would always end up in a knot. And it was so cute. And they, we would be in the in one of the conferences or, or whatever, and we'd be in there, and everybody's phone would go wonky. We had three people around us, their phones went dead for the cameras. You know, they they had full batteries. They charged them up. The phones are going dead. The lights are flashing on and off. Uh, there was a, a, a storm or something. And what was that happened when the, the cloud went over or something? 
uh, there was a storm or something, and they had to hunker down in uh, one of the conferences, and it just kind of blew past because it's just uh, all the energy. It's it's amazing. I think at one of the UFO conferences, some mm-hmm. people went to dinner, and they saw one. It's like, <laughs> really? Well, getting back to those mics, the, 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 the mic was always, every time she would, I mean, if she would she would lay it out there in a straight line, we'd all take a, a bathroom break. I mean, it wasn't very long, and she'd come back and she'd pick it up and show it to everybody. See, this is what they do to me. This is what they do to me. She got a kick out of it every time. Yeah. I think yeah. she did too. You know, one of the um, one of the things I like is the story that would, she would talk about um, how the SC would knock on the walls. Did they, did any of that happen? Yes, in my session. Oh my goodness. Yeah, talk yes. about that. Well, uh, we were doing the interview, and then. They started knocking on the walls, and I, I, you know, this was really out of the box for me, just having, just sitting there and hearing all these knocks, and the Lord says, oh, we're ready, you need to go to the restroom, we need to get started, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do just what they said, okay, so I scampered in there, used the restroom, and uh, we, 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 I Lay down and they st- and the door started and well they were knocking they were continued to knock they were on the tape yeah they, they continued here on the recording uh, uh, for a while mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, I'm a believer I I'm a believer uh, it was it it spooked me almost because uh, I, I didn't really know what was going to happen and then you hear all these knocks from all over every direction it wasn't just from one side it was the ceiling all the walls. And then Dolores just nonchalantly says, "Oh, we're ready for you. We need to go. Go to the restroom." Not interesting. I had a um, my very last session actually. Oh, had that happen. Oh my, yes, but probably no more uh, significant than just my very last session of like last week. In the middle of the session, um, and and he's he's in like the SC part. He's in the mm-hmm. he's in the part where he's answering questions and he's supposed to be as, as deep and connected as ever and there is this giant knock I mean knock 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 one two three and I look up because I, you know I'm looking to see if somebody at the door or whatever and no I get my at the glass door I can see you know there's got a little curtain over it but I can see if anyone's there there's nobody there but that that is where the knock seems to come from mm-hmm. And the client actually, because he was he was in a dual place, he knew he was laying in bed having this session just like you did, Laura. Uh, but at the same time, he's still having this session. He actually says, he actually says to me something like, "Well, Candace, if you have someone at the door, you should go. Oh my you should go answer that." And I looked over, you know, and I know, and there's no one there. And I said, and then I told him actually exactly that. I said, "There's no one at." at the door, this is what happened with Dolores and it happens with other practitioners. When we hear this knocking, that is, you know, the energies and those coming forth, coming through, ready here to help you. So you just, you know, you just take that knocking and you say this is what it is and you help propel your client to more, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to to face and to accept and and to, you know, um, receive. And that's where you get those things, isn't it? Achieve, wait, tell me what your words are again. Say it again. Ask, believe, allow, and receive. There you go. (laughs) Words to live by. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, you were saying something about Dolores' hugs and her soft cheeks. Oh, when when Dolores would hug Laura, she Laura would walk into the room, Dolores would be, and she'd just lighten up, she'd smile, and she'd, you know, oh, there's my angel. She would put her arms around and lock her fingers together and put her so close. And I was lucky enough to get some of those, too. And she could do a bear hug. This little old lady, this great grandma, could put a bear hug on you, but then I, I kissed her cheek once. I wasn't very bold, and and I kissed her cheek <laughs> so, so it's like you are embraced by. You were just embraced. You were just enveloped in this energy and this hug and the softness and the, the love, love that's in that hug it was amazing, mm-hmm. and it was such a, a a privilege to see her every time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
and I know Laura was concerned the last time we saw her that, that it was, um, it, you know, that she may not be a, with us as long as we thought she would be. We just kind of, you kind of think somebody like that's going to live forever. And, uh, and she, she told everybody that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I used but, to, um, yeah. you know, I think she's doing so much on the other side without the impediment mm-hmm. of a body, of an old lady's body, that she can reach so many people in so many ways. Heck, she messed with my Kindle. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> nobody messes with my Kindle. And let the Laura can anytime she wants. So that was uh, that was pretty interesting. How she comes up, and, and, and like you say, the clients come up and 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 they say, "I don't really understand what this is, but I have to do this." And it's like, okay, well, and then you visit with them on the phone, you try to answer their questions, prepare them a little bit, and then you do the interview. And the thing is, in the interview, it's not you're not stepping on eggshells like a family member would be or a close friend would be. You can say anything you want, you can ask anything you want, and so it helps them bring it forward, and and you know, confront some things that other people wouldn't challenge them on. And you, you can say that. You know, we're not telling you what to do, but what would happen if? Well, why do you think that's going on? And how's that working for you? <laughs> yeah, oh that's the worst. How's that working for you? And famous the, last word. Famous word. How's that Fair working out for you? Hanging on to that. Yep. Hanging on to that anger. Well, it's not working very well. Well, throw that rock out of your backpack. You know, okay. so, you, so you kind of prepare that this is what can happen. You know, do you want to get that rock out of your backpack? Mm-hmm. You know, do you want to get that weight off your shoulders? Do you want to still have that anger? You can hold on to that anger. Okay, well, anger's winning. You're losing. You're sick. You know, you know it, so what are you going to do? It's your choice. You can really, really let it go. Are you, who was it? Was the worst had the, the client who said, uh, but if I forgive my wife, she'll win? And the Laura said, "Well, if you die, she wins." <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> you know. So, what do you want? You know, do you want to let it go? Forgive mm-hmm. and let it go. Forgive doesn't mean it was okay what they did. That doesn't mean that. It means it happened. It was what it was. And you're saying, "Okay, that's what it is. It's it's over. It's done. I'm moving on. I've learned." I'm moving on. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so it's not like that you're one up because you have to forgive somebody because you're right and they're wrong. No, it's more of a oh, let it go, release it. Okay, you got what you got from it. It is what it was. It's on. One of the last messages I personally got from Dolores was, you know, you can move forward a lot faster if you're not looking backwards at all. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you're hit, it's like riding a horse, you know, when you, when you ride a horse, you, you put your head and your face where you're going, not where you come from, um, otherwise you're turning around and, and <laughs> going being, backwards. That's why being present is so important. I mean, we've had clients, and they would be so stuck in the anger and bitterness from the past, and it was the lousy past, you know, it really was, but they were so stuck with being angry about it and still Right. Yeah, every time they get wound up, every time they mm-hmm. talk about it. And then they're looking to the future. They have all these aspirations and, and dreams. They want to do this and that, which which would be wonderful. And they're missing the present moment and not seeing the blessings they have right in front of them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's just like, okay, well, that's good to want to do that. And, you know, this thing is done. There's nobody, They can't undo what, what mm-hmm. happened. You know, you can't undo, but you can let it go. You can let it go. Yeah, your reaction to it. Your reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's your choice. And you think you don't have a choice. You do have a choice. You know, you're talking about hugs. I have to to tell you this. So my my memory of Dolores and a hug was something a little different than yours. (laughs) So, you know, you, you, Laura, and Dolores had such an incredible bond. Um, And and I, and I, Love you guys both so much um, for that and so many other things. But let me tell you, so when I, I took Dolores' class in 2008, and I showed up in 2009 for the for the next class, and it already had started um, with her blessing, the support form. So, you know, I, you know, I sort of, 
know, she kind of knew me, right? She knew my name and everything. So I came to level two. And, of course, i had been thinking, doing, practicing, nothing more than her work, like, you know, for this whole year. And when I saw her, I couldn't help myself. I ran up to her, and I just hugged her. <laughs> And she didn't. She didn't hug me back the way. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't have the, the quite the same thing. She actually, I'll never forget it because she was sweet. She was sweet. She she looked at me, but but he, he, she didn't hug me back with a bear hug like that. She didn't hug me back. She did hug me back. But here's what she said. She went, "Oh, you're squishing me." <laughs> yeah, you're. Squishing me. me. Oh my I can't imagine that because she was the one who had this. Oh my goodness, she was strong. She yeah. was really strong. She had to be to do all she did. I mean, you got to figure. Even a young person would get exhausted traveling all over, talking constantly, doing the class. I don't know how she writing did. Writing the books. I mean, really, you know, it would have taken a normal person under fifty years to do what she did. I don't know how she did it with all of those books. You know, I was blessed to be able to assist many, many classes with her, and when the day was over and we ate a little dinner and get back to the hotel room and it was like, conk, you know, mm-hmm. hit the hit yeah. the hay, that's when she would go, yeah. like, start she writing was. more, yeah, and editing other books. Yes. Oh, In right? her 80s. Yeah. In her 80s. How did she do that? After the week before, she was in China doing the same thing. I know. It's, you know, talk about, you know, having a passion, a purpose, and support behind the scenes. She must have, right? And it wasn't easy. I mean, she didn't have an easy life. No, she didn't. She did not have an easy life. And she had a lot of other responsibilities. But she kept this and developed it. And it takes a lot of guts to step outside the box when people around you uh, are not wanting you to do that. Right. You know, and she did it. And, and she did it for us. And she was a rebel. She was really ahead of her time. She was. She just knowing Dolores and being fortunate enough to have taken her classes just as a woman gives me strength. Doesn't it you Candace? Oh my that? gosh, does it ever I mean she's just pioneered everything. She broke the glass ceilings of air I mean for well, many of UFO us. research and Nostradamus research mm-hmm. and, and you know, the hypnosis research. She has uh, accolades from all over the world. Uh, they wanted her to go to Mongolia, speaking of Mongolia. She, they had invited her there, and she said, I can't go to Mongolia. Come see me in China. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love that story. She does. T- she told that story very well. They wanted me to go to Mongolia. <laughs> But I told them they had to come to China. What I loved about Dolores was, you know what I loved about Dolores? She didn't care what people thought about her. They didn't. She didn't. She was going to go towards her path, towards her goal, and do what she needed to do, what she was driven to do, what she knew she had to do, what her curiosity brought her to. And she didn't care what other people said. And um, she was one of the bravest people I've ever met in my life. Thank you. And if I have any bravery in me at all to continue on my path, it's because of and the example that she has provided. We all do. We all we all do. We got the strength from her. And we when we need help, we're in a session and things. What do you see? Nothing. <laughs> 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 we do. We call them in. Dolores, come on, help Dolores. And and eventually you're able to you know get something. But, uh, you know, that first moment of panic when they don't see anything, it's like, oh, gosh, another one. <laughs> when, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, Joni's talking about sitting in session with the client. Sometimes sometimes it doesn't go like the textbook, um, you know, a write-up of it all. But here's the thing that, that we've all found. You know, even before Dolores passed on, I found that I, if I just took a breath and I asked myself, what would Dolores do? Mm. Or if I just imagined Dolores in the room with me, it was like bringing forth her energy. And then on, on top of her energy, the practitioners who we share with, who help us in that community, in that community of support together, yes. 
So I always say, even to those who are brand new at this when you're sitting down, you are not sitting there by yourself. Mm-hmm. Dolores is with you. Mm-hmm. She's almost always on your right hand, right hand side. I don't know why, but it's the right hand side. And the rest of us in the community are there with you. And if you kind of think about that and um, accept that, suddenly everything, it's not really up to you. It's kind of, you're just like a spark plug or something, like you know? And yeah. It through and they use your body to, to ask the questions. That's what, I've had two clients now that are uh, are level one dedicated practitioners. They, they took the online class and uh, uh, just finished it last month. But uh, one of them asked me about, well, do you ever get nervous being a practitioner asking questions? And I said, well, the way I see it, and, and I, I think I talked to Dolores about this mm-hmm. one time, and she put it this way. Or if you think you're really thinking of all those questions, you know, let me tell you, they're helping you. So, so just think of yourself as a vessel and ask them to come through and use your body to ask the questions. And I told my two clients that are practitioners about that, and they said, that's a good way of asking or a good way of thinking of it is thinking uh, in that well, term. We've, we've been calling Dolores since we first started practicing. Uh, you know, just here, I think all of us have. I think we, we all have, just like you. We didn't wait until she crossed over. We were right in the beginning. What would Dolores do? You know, I'm going to get a T-shirt, WWDD. <laughs> <laughs> I think something's interesting happening there. What What do you think? I think that... Oh, and I have a tone in my right ear as I'm saying this. Yeah. So I had this thought that somehow, you know how Dolores is so special and amazing and like a pioneer uh, for us, of course. I keep having this thought that she's like she's like being like the pioneer on the spirit side too. I believe uh, that. Would, back, that would totally back, to, back towards us here yeah. helping us. Doesn't it? Do you like yeah. that to you? She's very busy. She seems very busy. busy. I think, and she can be in so many places at once. Yeah. And I think maybe even spirits don't, some don't realize. You know, you have this one there and this one there, but she's just rabble rabbling all over the globe. <laughs> I mean, really, you, talk, you have practitioners all over the globe saying, Dolores was here, Dolores came through. It's like, mm-hmm. well, she can do that now. I have a thought. I mean, most of us, we experience a lifetime. And then when we cross over, we'll have a life review, and then we'll learn about the lessons that we agreed to in this life. And then we just rest and we move forward or think about reincarnating. Dolores is busy still I think achieving so. mm-hmm. uh, goals mm-hmm. from the other side, still continuing to give love and guidance mm-hmm. to all. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, I think she's just been a special... A special woman in in the physical and on the spirit side right now. I yeah. really do. I think I think you know her passing, and I you know I, I don't know. You tell me. I, I think it might have um, her conscious mind might have been a little surprised too. I think she I think she really believed it when she said she was going to live to be a hundred or a hundred and three, mm-hmm. and she didn't quite make it. But I think what's happened is she's. So um, she's so valuable where she is. I have this. Mm-hmm. I have this. You tell me if this sounds right to you, okay? And this is just now kind of coming while that tone was in my ear. I really, really see her. You know, some people go into the veil or cross across the veil, and and they 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 go way into the spirit side, like if it's a pool. You know, they're going all the way into the deep end or whatever. But it's like she just went, she's just like just over. That's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. It feels like she's just over uh-huh. doing something right there at that line. Right. What do you right think? Right at that interface. That makes sense. I mean, in a way we can conceive of her being in an interface between, you know, our dimension, our 3D mm-hmm. dimension, and and the forces above it. Like in a quantum sense, she is interfacing mm-hmm. because she hasn't gone off on her mm-hmm. uh, next. Well, she may have a le- next life. I mean, you can do both. Um, but because you're, you're multi-dimensional, you're multi-dimensional. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing that I appreciate that she's done is she's brought so many authors uh, to my notice yeah. that have given me information that I can pass on to help my clients in other ways. 
Absolutely. So we sell books. We pass out books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really great, great authors. Mm-hmm. Great authors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was authors. very good. Yes, it was wonderful. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, when Dolores couldn't get her books published, she just flat started her own publishing yes. company. So that was our Dolores. You know, she <laughs> she wasn't going to be told no. Um, and I love that about her. Well, ladies, we've been chatting for a good two hours. <laughs> And sun comes up early um, at a Chiraman farm. You know we have a rooster, right? Yes, yep. yeah. That 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 rooster. That rooster's name is Flappy. I did not name him. I did not name him. <laughs> but Flappy starts crowing. Flappy. Flappy starts crowing long before the sun rises. So I think this might be a good time to wind it down. Mm-hmm. Can you please tell our listeners, lady, how how they may find you on the internet or whatever? Um, Laura? Well, the DoloresQHHT.com. And uh, I also have a website, uh, QuantumHealingOKC.com. Mm-hmm. That's where you can That's find you Laura. Can find me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How about you, Joan? Oh, uh, what's my website? Oh, oh you go to the Dolores Cannon QHHT. Dolores. Dolores. It's Dolores Cannon QHHT.com. And uh, it, we're in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and we both take clients. She can take them during the week. Because um, I didn't put her last name down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I, I work, so I, I generally get a, take clients on the weekend. But mm-hmm. uh, since she can do them during the week, then she's available for some people mm-hmm. who maybe have days off during the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing clients from Texas and from, and from Dallas, Dallas, and Tulsa, Tulsa mm-hmm. and Dallas, and from, um, from Western Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm always sending them down your way too. You. When, you know, when, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, you know, I want to ask you. I love that black and white picture of you on the. Uh, oh, that's an old one. It's but so beautiful. So be- well, I got a couple of you and and the horse and the donkey today. Yeah. So I can be amazed considerably. I, th- I think we're gonna put some of those on the YouTube replay here. So, but on the Dolores Cannon QHHT dot com, there are photo. Um, listings of practitioners all around the world. Yeah, and, uh, I'll probably update mine. That's all right, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if you like the one of you and the horse. Um, it was pretty cute, but you're giving, you're giving my mom a bell a kiss, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you who are listening this evening, all of you who love and appreciate Dolores, um, whether you're listening live or in the archives and further in the time. If you'd like to find out about me and my practice, you can go to newearthjourney.com. And once again, to find a dedicated practitioner of Dolores' method near you, please go to Dolores Cannon, QHHT.com. We love and we miss Dolores, but we know that she is here with us. And we just want to say thank you and love you. And next week, we're going to have an amazing show with the amazing Alba Wyman of Miami, Florida. We're going to have a Halloween show. And uh, I think you might be interested in uh, hearing some of the stories that our lovely Alba might have to say. It would be perfect timing for Halloween. So thank you. I want to thank uh, N5D once again for sponsoring and allowing us to speak with you all out there about Dolores Cannon QHHT. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Joni. I love you. Thank you, Thank you, Love you, too. Love you, too. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone Good in night. the chat room. Good night, MJ. Good night, Barbara. Good night, MJ. We love you. We love you. <laughs>